thousand years ago, a poet called this land South of the Clouds. And today, those clouds and the warm eastern sea still cradle my land, still witness its timeless tranquility. Cities with ancient names lie south of these clouds, but they are modern now. Of course, in my city, Damascus, there are old quarters. I have walked through them often with my servant girl. Indeed, as a Mamadan family, I took pride in these signs of age. Always, behind the walls of my home, which is in one of the oldest and grandest parts of Damascus, I found pride and strength in the fact that I, Nejna Murad, was the daughter of a proud tradition. Our house is usually tranquil, but I have learned that when it is not, it bears watching. My mother's first words informed me that I was the substance of the argument. Father, of course, was the judge of whether I was to be permitted to attend college at Beirut. Ahmed, my brother, argued that I must go. Mother was opposed to it, but Ahmed argued well. He said, men today want women who are educated and intelligent. I want such a wife for myself. Ahmed won his point. He usually does. And mother gave in, though not without the last word, which is, of course, a woman's traditional privilege, however futile. I suppose it was about the same time in a mountain village that a girl named Suhad Yusuf was preparing to go to college too. Suhad was a Christian, not unattractive, and of that stock of Lebanese Christians who are as hardy and independent as the mountains of Jabal Baruch themselves. These are common people rather unpolished in speech and habit, but all Lebanon respects them for their history of never having surrendered to a conqueror. No, Saad then, but I imagine she would have been popular with the townspeople. And there would have been a demonstration of tears when she boarded the bus for Beirut. Ours was the same destination, the Beirut College for Women. It would seem rather strange, wouldn't it, that Najla Murad and Saad Youssef would come to reside in the same place. But the college is like that. It takes girls from all nations, of all religions, of all classes. Throughout the Arab world, it's known as a great school and a most democratic institution. I must say, this last virtue failed entirely to charm my mother, who would have preferred a more exclusive place. But after bringing me there, Ahmed and father very skillfully whisked her away before the old argument could be reopened. I 
had several rude jokes from the beginning. Nobody there to meet me. Evidently, all the students were just, just supposed to be treated alike. And, well, the familiarity was quite embarrassing, something I was completely unaccustomed to. The rudest shock of all came when I discovered I was to share my room with another, with a country girl. She seemed surprised at my coolness. Well, I felt it necessary to establish a proper relationship between us right from the start. For the moment, I wished mother had won her argument. In a matter of moments, I learned volumes about Saad Yusuf. She was a good soul, always ready to help, and like many of her class, did everything well. The Christian mission was sending her to college, family too poor to afford it otherwise. She wasn't the least disturbed at rooming with an aristocrat. In some, that attitude would have been insufferable. But in Suhad, it wasn't at all. I felt some qualms about meeting everyone at once. Not Suhad. She seemed quite gay. The room was full to overflowing. More than 200 girls in the student body, and it seemed that Sohad already knew them all. Positively no reserve. She chattered like a bird to everyone. A very attractive teacher entered after a few moments, and with surprising ease and grace, brought quiet to the room. Immediately, she led in the singing of a Christian hymn. Most of the others joined in, but it would have been impossible for me to indulge in public singing like that, even if I had known the words. I felt lonely and strange in such an atmosphere. I confess, I wished secretly that I could have had some of Sohad's gift for making friends. I wondered if the teacher came over to meet me because I was a Murad of Damascus, or because at that moment she sensed I was an unhappy girl. I've since learnt the answer, but I was so grateful she came. That evening, Saad and I did those things in our room designed to make it livable for each of us in our own way. It was so comforting to feel myself close to my family again. Their photographs in my hands were like a wondrous mirror, reflecting the life I'd known until that day. A sheltered life, perhaps, but a glorious one. The warmth within me would not be contained. I felt compelled to show them, to speak of them, even to Suhad. Suddenly, I grew curious to know of her background and asked if she had a photograph of her family. It was incredible. 
she was an orphan, lived with her grandmother in that awful little house. To hear her speak of it with such pride and affection. I didn't want to hurt her, but it was difficult to mask my feelings. School began next morning, and with the stimulus of learning and the pressure of work, days flowed easily into weeks, and weeks into months. Found myself discovering exciting new worlds whose existence I'd never suspected. But there were sides of school life that repelled me. I remember a program of folk dancing one Saturday afternoon. Cavorting in peasant costumes was not for Nejna Murad, but Suad simply reveled in it. There was no understanding that girl. Perhaps my greatest shock in those early months came one afternoon when some boys from the university suddenly appeared and bore down on a girl named Layla and myself. An unmarried girl of my position does not meet with strange men unchaperoned and by chance. The choice of a husband was not mine. He would be selected for me by my father. I tried to be civil, and yet really, they were quite nice, so much younger than my husband would be. Mostly my days at school that first term went undisturbed. Gradually, I slipped into the pattern of college life. Somehow, social difference dissolved with the days, washed out of my thinking. They call it fellowship at Christian schools, and though it took time to affect my way of thought, I came to feel this, this fellowship, and it spelled the happiest time of my life. Things went along well until a sociology class near the end of the first year. We were expected to do field work as part of the course. In this way, the college makes itself felt in the social welfare of nearby communities. My name was listed to assist at the clinic in the town of Sidon. Sidon was flooded with refugees, miserable, unfortunate people. And one doctor, a woman, labored endlessly to treat them. The sight of these people, the odor, the whole grim atmosphere was unbearable. I'd never come face to face with suffering before. I was expected to help. Two of the girls were doing their part. I tried, but how could I do this? These people were beneath me, beyond me, and now they were so close, close enough to touch. Finally, I couldn't stand it any longer. I felt I had to leave college after that. Felt inferior to my friends. 
I, Nezla Murad, inferior. We went up to the roof, to a lovely place where the city spreads like mosaic at one's feet. There, Saad's understanding helped calm me. From that high place, everything seemed small, and I too felt small and insignificant. For the first time, I caught a glimpse of Nejla Murad in perspective. The next day, Saad took me to the neighborhood house, a nursery attached to the college. She had spoken for me, arranged for me to do my sociology field work there. She was a strange, wonderful person. Somehow she understood that here I could be myself. I could be even better than myself. The children were adorable. They were from poor families, but there was no poverty in their eyes. They looked so clean and gay. I was completely taken in by them. Scarcely noticed Sahad leave. The afternoon flew by. We molded clay, but I felt I was molding something far more lasting. For the first time, I was beginning to forget myself in my desire to give these children the care and affection they needed. I was sorry when it was time to leave. You see, I hadn't merely given those children something they needed. They had done as much for me. Thereafter, I felt drawn even closer to the other girls. We shared not only a common school, but a common experience that reached beyond these rooms, touching the lives of others who had been strangers and by so doing, enriching our own. It was delightful, this, this fellowship. Imagine Nejla Murad, lost in laughter with girls of every conceivable station in life. Imagine this Nejla eating cookies with Protestants, Jews, Maronites, Greeks, she had certainly changed this past year. Yes, I had changed. Mother might have felt I had abandoned my privilege, but I felt I had discovered it. In our second year, the president of the college assembled us and introduced the speaker. He was a young Christian doctor named Ibrahim Farrej. He asked for volunteers to assist in a project at a village called Hain Yaqub, where a college work camp would be established next summer. He described the primitive conditions, the need those villagers had for the help we could bring them. I was still repelled by the thought of facing dirt, disease, distress. I wanted to go with the others, but I couldn't. It simply wasn't in me. When Sohad volunteered, I wanted to place my name with hers. But I froze where I stood, saw those faces in a line, as I had seen them at Sidon Clinic and ran away again. 
Then, one afternoon, Saad invited me for a walk. I'd forgotten Ayn Yaqub, had already written my parents that I'd summer with them at the mountains as usual. Soon we had left the modern section and found ourselves on the outskirts of the city. Then we were in a refugee camp, and I knew I hadn't forgotten Ayn Yaqub. I thought of the children at the neighborhood house, and these faces said, Ayn Yaqub, said it now as a challenge, now as a prayer. That evening, Sohat said, God does not want humanity to suffer. He wants us to make a better world. And to help us, he will give us the strength we need. I asked her how she could be so sure. She said, because I am a Christian. And because Jesus said, I come that ye might have life and have it more abundantly. Listening to Suhad, I knew what I had to do. Her faith gave me the strength I lacked. That summer at Ayn Yaqub brought me south of those clouds in which I had always lived and down to the earth and its people. I found a living poetry in those fields, a rare beauty in scenes so common that once I would not have bothered to notice them. We pitched our tents like Bedouins on a hillside near Ayn Yaqub, and then we gathered within the camp to meet the village headman. He had come to greet us on behalf of his people and to express their gratitude and his own. He was a man of uncommon dignity and good humor. He promised he would do all in his power to assist us and one could sense he was a man of his word. Through the weeks that followed, students and faculty lived and worked with the villagers. There was instruction in poultry raising, where local farmers were taught modern agricultural practice, that their standard of living might be improved. So I taught the children of Ayn Yaqub how to read and write. Her youngsters ranged from 6 to 14, and for many, this was the first instruction they had ever received. She made a marvelous teacher, so winning, so tireless, so patient. And I had asked for a special assignment. Yes, Saad had been right. Something, perhaps it was God, gave me the strength to face this thing that had once been too much for me. I had asked to be assigned to the dispensary the first day in camp. And after a few weeks, I became quite proficient. The doctor himself said I was a natural nurse. Strange, but I considered his words the highest compliment I had ever been paid.
In the evening, we would have services. Somehow I felt I belonged here, worshiping with the others at the twilight moment, thanking the unseen power, asking him for new strength to carry on our work. The pastor read, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give ye rest. Were not these words meant for all men and women, the sick we tended each day, myself who had feared to come here and who in his presence had found the peace he promised? No, I did not feel it wrong to join with these Christians in prayer, for never had God seemed so close. That summer had wings. Before we knew it, we were breaking camp and the headman had come to bid us goodbye. He thanked us for all we had done, asked us to return next summer. Indeed, he asked that a teacher and a doctor come to Ayn Yaqub to live among his people. So I told him she would return to teach after graduation. It was a promise. Our remaining years at the college took wings too and it was with apprehension that I watched them slip by. This, I realized, was the hour of freedom in my life. When it was gone, what was there left for me but to return to my walled existence, to marry a stranger beyond my age, to wear the veil again that cut me off from people. People had enriched my life, given it meaning, would it lose its meaning when this hour was gone? There was nothing to do but live in the rhythm of today, trying not to think of tomorrow. Commencement had come, our commencement. Strange, is it not? that the ending of college should be called the beginning. But for Najla Murad, would it be a beginning or an end? In these closing minutes of my hour of freedom, I wondered. Pastor Aude offered the invocation. It was a moment of meditation for each of us, a moment made meaningful by the knowledge that in a few moments we would be dispersed, returning to the dozen lands from which we came, each to our own destinies. And this thought was developed by one of our outstanding educators. She called upon us to lead the way to a new era as women of an independent people. Over there was such excitement. Ahmed, mother, father, their pride touched me so. I 
could see Sohant with her grandmother, their sacrifices had borne fruit. Sohat calling me, wondered what it was. She told me, overjoyed, she had been awarded a scholarship to continue her studies at a university in the United States. The letter was from the church board and it said, Sohad Yusuf, scholarship granted the United States. I was so happy for her. We were in the midst of plans for a visit Sohad would make to my home before she sailed, when the headman of Ayn Yaqub brought us back to Earth. He congratulated us on our graduation, and then he reminded Sohad of her promise to return to his village and live there as a teacher among his people. As I listened, I was crushed, knowing that Sohad was not one who failed in her promises. We wanted only to be alone and went to that place which had come to have a special significance for us both. Sohad's dilemma seemed so hopeless. Suddenly, an idea began to form and my mind, thus stimulated, soared beyond the reach of time and space, looked beyond the horizon and into the depths of my heart. I saw the life ahead of me in society at Damascus, a cultured, composed, superficial existence a life in the clouds, removed from reality. There I might bloom like a cut flower, but how could I grow without roots? I saw the life awaiting me and wondered how I could endure it. How could I silence the concern I had discovered within myself? The concern whose human harvest had brought me the purest happiness of my life. How could I forget human need? Could I find peace in the clouds now that my heart had been to earth? Now that my heart had been to earth. I remembered going with the doctor to visit a woman at Hainyaku. She was hopelessly ill and yet she found hope in our presence. I too had found hope in hers. The hope that I might learn to love mankind and find my identity in its midst. That was it, to find myself. How could I stop looking now that I had come so far along the way? I couldn't stop now. I told Sohad Yusuf that I would go to the village in her place. And to myself, I prayed for all the Sohads who might never have her chance. Each of us had our paths to follow. Sohads would carry her beyond the seas to a great new world. Mine would bring me back to the land I loved, south of the clouds, where I would seek the meaning of myself. <laughs>